I'll get started by saying hello, everyone. My name is Paige Reese. I am the COO at SongVest. And um, just introducing Sean Peace, the CEO, um, as, as the host for, for this panel on how to invest in music royalties and the benefits of that. Um, Sean has been selling music royalties in one form or another since 2006, 2007, and is certainly an expert in um, this area of alternative investment. So thank you for joining us today. Like I said, there's a chat and a Q&A at the bottom. Feel free to submit any questions um, and we will make sure to get those answered for you. So with that, Sean, I will stop, stop my music and turn it over to you. Yeah, it might be good to have that background music playing the whole time. <laughs> okay, let me go ahead and share my screen. Can you see it okay, Paige? Yes. Okay. Well, I appreciate everybody taking time to uh, join us today. Sorry that we delayed it a week. Uh, we were actually in uh, Music Biz last week in Nashville. And so um, when we set all of this up, we didn't realize that that overlap during that conference. Uh, so appreciate you making the, uh, the time to, to move it to this week. Uh, if you need anything at the end, uh, want to uh, link to the recording or anything like that, uh, just add that to the comments and, and certainly Paige will get that over to you or I'll get it over to you. Um, if you have not paid attention or have not seen this in the news over the last really two years, there has just been an outpouring of investment in music royalties, uh, whether it's, for example, the, the company Hypnosis, which is a public company over in the UK, um, whether it's uh, even people like Sony buying catalogs or Cobalt or um, Primary Wave, it's just been everywhere that um, larger investment companies are moving into the music royalty space. Uh, and, and why is that? I mean, if you look at kind of the contraction that music royalties as a whole have had, looking at, for example, this chart, uh, you can see the, the decline over the late 2000s into 2010 and 2011 um, as people were transitioning from CDs to digital downloads and then into streaming. And then, of course, you see really at 2015 is when streaming started to, to really take off. And we saw a global rebound in the music market um, and that acceleration just continuing to get larger and larger. Um, so from an overall market share perspective, uh, it's not just that that streaming is growing. It's actually adding to the pie year over year uh, in from a music royalty perspective. And, and we see that in addition, when we look at, for example, Goldman Sachs projections um, for annual rev revenue, um, we're saying in 2021, for example, if we're just looking at um, recorded music, uh, or let's just look at streaming, you know, it's at 21 billion in 2021, and they're projecting it to be 52 billion by 2030. So, uh, so nice, uh, from an investment perspective, a nice steady increase in those numbers. They're projecting around um, flattening off to around 6% year over year growth in the, the music royalty or, uh, marketplace or all, all recorded music royalties. So again, why is that important? Uh, if we look at music royalties as, as an alternative investment, um, traditionally in the world that we've been living in of zero interest rates, um, it has a higher investment yield um, than you might find in traditional, certainly traditional treasuries. It's really been an overlooked investment class, mainly because there's, there hasn't been access to it. 
Um, unless you know someone in the music industry, unless you can get access to deal flow, um, you know, there really wasn't an opportunity uh, for you to try and purchase music royalties as an alternative. Um, I did start a company called Royalty Exchange back in 2011, which was the first online marketplace in which to buy catalogs. Um, we now at Songvest do the same thing, but we do have a, a differentiator that we'll talk about in a little bit, which is we took the route to get it SEC qualified. So it is a true financial instrument um, that you can feel safe investing in um, because it is a true security. And in addition to that, there is the um, liquidity aspect of it because all of these song shares are, are tradable. But we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, the best part about uh, music royalties, and again, it's because it is an alt, is that it's not correlated to the market or other classes, asset classes. So even if there is a huge downturn in the economy, um, you know, royalties still continue to be generated. And even if there is a blip, like the craziness that we had during COVID, which actually, you know, generationally or globally change the way that people consume their, their consumption behavior, um, you know, it, it rebounds right back because as you can think, you know, the economy can slow down, inflation can rise, but we still listen to music. And, and unless we change our behavior and cancel that Spotify uh, streaming account and or Apple, um, you know, those royalties are gonna stay pretty consistent and non-correlated. And as we mentioned uh, earlier, you know, there is a consistent growth rate um, with, with royal music royalties or the, the global music market. And other people are starting to take notice. So for example, in this particular screen uh, or in this particular image here on the right, uh, Blackstone invested in hypnosis, you know, a billion dollars. And that's just one of the bees that have been rolling around in music royalties. Um, People are finally starting to take notice uh, and investing, uh, again, not small dollar amounts, but massive dollar amounts in, in, music mark, in the music marketplace. Um, just for some background so that you guys can better understand just how music royalties are generated, and we're not going to spend too much time on this. Um, you can actually, this was a, a graphic from CD Baby. Uh, you can go out and there's tons of materials which kind of share the, the breakdown of how music royalties are generated. Uh, but at the end of the day, you normally have, and some of these can be combined, meaning the songwriter who actually writes the song, which can be the artist on the far right. Um, usually when a songwriter uh, writes a song, they are partnered with a publisher uh, and that split can be anywhere from 50% uh, to a co-pub deal where it's 75 to the songwriter, 25 to the publisher. And then finally, the record label. So the record label is usually involved when, um, because they're the ones that are helping the artist, you know, put the album together and promote it. And then ultimately the artist. Um, so those are all four of those buckets are buckets that we can package and sell on the platform because any one of these people have rights to royalties that they can then monetize. And those royalties come from different buckets as well. So on the publishing and the songwriter side, you have performance royalties. That's really over air performance, like uh, on the radio to make it very simple. Uh, then there's mechanical royalties, and mechanical royalties are somewhat uh, also tied to, um, um, to streaming, because that's actually, when, when you're paying for Spotify, that's actually considered a mechanical royalty. Um, so that mechanical royalty is paid out. Uh, print, of course, is not, not huge, but, but print, when you have sheet music, that is actually a royalty and then sync is uh, when it's in a movie or a television show. And then finally sampling, um, that's if your music is used, you know, like in a, say it's, it's sampled in the background of a rap song. Uh, and then finally you have um, non-interactive digital performance. Uh, that is, uh, for example, uh, Cirrus, Cirrus XM. Um, 
So all of those are different, usually different organizations uh, that can be paying those royalties. Uh, and all of those can be certain types of revenue streams that might be packaged and sold uh, on whether it's our platform or again, through means that you might purchase. Whoops. So what are, let me make sure this is right. Yep. So what are song shares and, and what do we do that's different than um, just going and purchasing a catalog? Uh, well, what we do is we utilize uh, what's called a Regulation A plus uh, offering and get that qualified by the SEC. Uh, this is a way for us to fractionalize music royalties into shares that you can then purchase. Now, this falls along the same lines that if you've seen, whether it's at Otis or Masterworks or Rally Road, where they're fractionalizing ownership of, say, fine art or wines or luxury cars or watches. Um, this is the same tried and true uh, method, you know, uh, framework, SEC framework that are used uh, among all of those platforms. So it's, although we're doing something really unique in the music industry, it's not so unique when we look at fractionalization on a whole and, and how others have been doing it. Um, our shares start at $250 per share. In that range, there is a, there is a market making mechanism that, that can allow that price to increase but for, for this conversation and for probably what you might be looking at on our platform, it really is gonna be probably that static $250 a share. Um, the best part from your perspective is liquidity. So uh, probably in the next 60 days, we will launch our secondary market, um, which allows you to uh, be liquid in any of the purchases that are made via song shares on the platform. So everything that we sell will be uh, posted uh, eventually in the secondary market. And that is a, uh, again, the same secondary market that all of the other Reggae Plus uh, users are using. It's, it's only on our platform. Uh, so people could come in and see the performance of each one of the assets and make those trades. Uh, the best part, of course, and the reason that you're buying this is for royalty payments. So we aggregate all of the royalties per quarter, and then uh, we reconcile those royalties and make those payments out uh, again um, right after the quarter closes. Um, and um, all of those are usually ACH transactions that, that we pay out. Um, and then the, the last part that I want to discuss uh, that, that we have a lot of questions on is like, well, what, what actually is the security? Like, am, am I getting ownership in the copyright? Uh, is there anything that I can do? Do I have audit rights or anything like that? Uh, in this particular case, the way that we, the way that we uh, create the security is that we are really monetizing the income from the contract between the seller and the buyer. Uh, so a seller might be a songwriter and they're selling say 50% of their writer's share of 20 songs, um, that would be sold to SongBest. And then what we're doing is we're monetizing the income that is derived or the royalties that are being paid through of that contract, that's what we're securitizing. So you receive that income, that, that right to that income uh, of that underlying contract. And the best part about this is the term is really 70 years um, after or 70 years after the death of the last author. So if there are three authors on the song and two of them are still living and one has passed away, that 70 year clock hasn't even started yet. It won't start until the, uh, all of the authors have, have passed away. So that, that really affects the rate of return when we talk about, because a lot of the questions are gonna be, well, what kind of rate of return are we gonna get? Well, the rate of return really decides on what time frame you wanna box this investment around, because it's not like a five-year treasury where it's five years or a 10-year. It is because this is potentially, you know, a 70-year plus 
income stream, um, you have to decide what kind of box you want to put around it and say, okay, we're going to project that we're going to hold this for, say, for example, 10 years. The best part about royalties is that if you have purchased a catalog that is somewhat stable in their royalties and you buy it at say $100,000 and let's say it's generating $10,000 a year, at the end of 10 years, you will have $100,000 that you've collected over that span. And then you might say, okay, for me to factor in my IRR, I'm going to exit at the end of 10 years. That means I'm gonna sell that asset. The interesting thing is you could potentially sell that asset if the royalties have been stable for what you bought it for. Um, because it just depends on how that, that particular group of songs has been performing over that period of time. So you have to remember in your, in your calculations, it's just not about the income that you generated. You have to decide, okay, after that 10 year time frame, if I'm gonna look at that to decide what my IRR is, then I can say, okay, well, am I divesting that asset? And if I am, at what value am I gonna divest it at? And that's the beauty of, song, of royalties is if, if those royalty streams have stayed constant, then you should be able to potentially sell that asset for, for what you have in it. Or if it's been slowly declining over time, then you, know, you might sell it for a little bit less, but um, you will be able to sell that asset certainly for, for something. So how does it work? Uh, just real quickly, so you know how it works from um, just a complete process perspective. Uh, you know, we sign the royalty agreements um, and what we do is we analyze those royalties for the seller. So uh, they'll bring us a, a group of songs and we'll look at that data, the past three years of data, we're gonna run our normal underwriting on it and we'll come back to them and say, you know what? We think this catalog should probably sell in a range of 250 to $300,000. Um, ultimately, it's up to them to decide what they wanna sell their catalog for. We again, just provide them a range. Once they decide what they uh, wanna sell that catalog for, then we can either go straight to purchase or we can do what's called a VIP auction. Sean, um, sorry, uh, just to oh, jump ahead. in. Sorry, this is a good time to um, answer, answer one of our questions on how we're finding the sellers or sure. um, how the deals come into Songvest. Sure, great. So um, because the music, and, and this has also been a problem of, the, of trying to invest in music, right? Um, the it is not as easy as just uh, for us, for example, creating an, a website with great SEO, uh, because that's not necessarily going to bring deal flow in. Um, more than likely, probably 80% of our deals come through our network. Because I've been selling uh, music royalties since all the way back to 2011, or actually really even before that, 2007, uh, we have a great network of people that, uh, that not only know about us, but trust us, uh, because that's the most important thing in the music industry. It's not uh, necessarily who you know, it's who you trust. And so we have a trusted network of people um, that go out and, and I don't want to say they source deals for us, because that's not necessarily the word, but as people decide that they want to sell uh, then they're going to seek out different ways in which to do it. And normally, um, you know, they, they seek out people who know us and feel comfortable with us, and therefore those deals come to us. Um, we think that that model is changing, though. Um, the, the multiples that people are buying for music right now are such that um, there are opportunities for us to go to record labels and to artists and say, hey, listen, this is a reason to sell. Um, uh, and so th those are our two kind of routes to market on, on where deal flow comes in. Any other questions on that page? No, that's it for now. Okay, great. Um, so the interesting thing that we do have is uh, once we sign a deal, we do have this VIP auction option. Um, it's, it's not so much probably going to be an option where uh, you're looking for catalogs to invest in, although it could. And it just, 
allows us to, to let the market decide what the price is uh, for a particular item that we have. It's interesting, it's kind of like a reverse Dutch auction. No one has really defined to me exactly what the terminology is, but it sounds like a reverse Dutch auction where basically all of the shares are laid out at, at a starting price and as all of those shares are allocated at that price, the price can move to a next level, which in essence moves your shares out so that you have to bid it, bid again at the second level. So it might start at 250 and go to 260, 270, 280. So the market can, can decide ultimately what the price of the asset should be. Um, once that pricing uh, has happened, either through a VIP auction or through the seller just saying, hey, listen, I want to sell it for 200000 period. Um, then we submit to the SEC. Uh, once that is qualified, then you can come in and actually purchase the song shares. Um, after you've purchased the song shares, of course, it's just like buying a stock per se. Uh, it's going to show up in your dashboard. The royalties will be paid out quarterly. And then, of course, we have the secondary market trading. So one of the things that I want to go into is if you're looking at a catalog, like what are some things that you should look at and some questions you should ask uh, when evaluating what you should pay for it? And I'm actually going to use a uh, auction that just uh, just closed on the site. Um, so this is one that if you go in the past auctions, you can actually see the listing for this. This was not a song share deal because we're still moving, we're transitioning from having just auctions on the site where it's one buyer and one seller to, uh, and, and most of our users are used to that model. And now for us to transition over to song shares and the securitized model, um, you know, we have to bring more and more investment professionals to the platform uh, who wanna utilize that particular model so it's not like we've transitioned everything over to song shares immediately. We're doing a slow roll. So we still have catalogs that we'll put up that are in a normal auction where you're buying 100% of that asset uh, and it's just you buying it. You know, we're not splitting it up into a security at all. So this is one of those particular examples. So one of the first things that you wanna look at is what are the different rights that are being sold? As we talked about in that other screen, you know, there's a writer share in publishing. Both of those are really paid from the same bucket. So whether, you, whether you're looking at writer share or publishing, uh, some people say publishing is a little bit more value, but it also comes at a cost because if you buy the publishing, then there are rights. There are things that you need to do to manage that catalog. Now, you can outsource to, that to somebody else and pay a fee to do it. But know that, that the bucket, when you're looking at writer share and publishing to do the analysis, um, you're going to ask the same questions because really it's all coming from the same uh, bucket of information or the bucket of royalty payment uh, uh, information. Um, so writer share and publishing might be one. Um, the, other, the other piece that you're going to ask for is... Um, you know, it, it, maybe it's uh, um, the master recordings that you're looking at. Master recordings might have a little bit less of a multiple uh, that you might pay for. When I say multiple, that's going to be the price. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and, and then there's like the artist share. So, so they're getting paid by the record label. Maybe they are not the writer or the publisher. Um, they're just the artist that was singing that song. Um, so that's the first thing you want to look at is say, OK, well, what is it that I'm buying? Uh, the next one is kind of the type of income. Um, so if you're buying writer share, for example, you could potentially only be buying the performance performance rights bucket. When we saw all those buckets of where money comes from, it could be that you're buying, for example, the writer share and only one of those buckets. So I'm only going to buy say the performance bucket of income. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the second piece that you wanna ask. Uh, and then finally is like, like who's paying it? Usually this is not something that's so important, but if it, uh, because for example, if it's a smaller distributor, even if that distributor uh, became insolvent, um, you know, that, 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 that 
those songs are going to move somewhere else and will continue to be paid. Like just because a distributor goes insolvent, that doesn't affect the rights that, that you have or that someone else might have to that song. And of course, they're going to whoever actually owns those particular rights are going to make sure that they move immediately so that the uh, income can continue to um, flow. Um, the next thing we're going to look at is like, what's the term? Usually everything that we're selling is life of copyright. And that's traditional in the industry. Um, you can have shorter term assets that people might sell every once in a while. Um, but most of the time, you're going to look at life of copyright. Uh, the next thing you're going to look at is really what, what were the last 12, month, uh, 12 months of royalties? Um, because that's what you care about. Uh, if, if the royalty has been flat, like in this, this example, it was not. It was very flat uh, in 2018, 2019. Then a whole bunch of songs were released, which is why we see that it spiked up. And now it's starting to come down a little bit. So in this particular case, you know, we may look at the last uh, uh, 12 months and go, okay, you know, there's still some decline, some, some real big decline that's happening. And in those particular cases, you know, you want to you want to try and do your best guess of, OK, it's still declining. So what is it going to continue to do, say, over the next 12 months or 24 months, et cetera? Um, so that's really what you're trying to do. You're trying to model out, you know, what songs are new songs, what songs are old songs, what songs are in flatline. I call it flatline. And then what songs are still in some kind of more more aggressive decline. And that's what you want to do to. Um, try and figure out what the trend is for that particular catalog, or you might even do trend models inside of that catalog, meaning, you know, there's some songs that are 10 years old and they're pretty flat, but we have to really do some trend lines for these three newer songs. Paige, any questions you want me to answer real quick? Uh, yes, and it kind of goes well into this slide as well, but mm -hmm. how is Songbest getting this information, you know, and, and making sure it's accurate and what we're presenting to, to potential buyers? Yeah, so here's the good news. All of this information is provided by the royalty payor. So whoever is paying the royalties, 99% uh, of the time, especially now in this day and age, uh, we get the detailed data. So I get to see by song. So for example, for Heat, uh, which is the top, uh, one of the top songs here. If I were to go and look into the details, I could see, for example, the last quarter it was streamed on Spotify, you know, whatever, 23 million times. Um, it, we have not seen a lot of discrepancy in this kind of data because the other data is public. So I can literally go to chart, chart metric and get a subscription there and I can look up heat and I can see exactly how many times heat has been streamed over the last quarter. Um, I can see how many times it, well, on Spotify to be specific or on Pandora. So not, not everyone reports publicly, Apple does not, uh, but Spotify, Pandora, you know, um, uh, trying to think of Deezer, you know, all, all of those have public reporting mechanisms that you can go and look. But we haven't seen, you know, uh, uh, usually we have not seen a major discrepancy in any of this data. So they provide that kind of detailed data down to the number of spins. And it depends on um, where you're getting the data from and how um, detailed it is. The only thing that's a bit wonky that is still changing in the industry is depending on who is paying the royalties, you can get a lot of noise from, you know, let's say that Sony, for example, is paying out royalties for the second half of 2021. So that, that statement just came out maybe a month ago. The first thing you're going to go is go, wow, you know, there's a big delay there. They, they're just now paying on the last half of last year, uh, and that's correct. Some, some other people pay a lot sooner, um, but a major label is gonna be delayed. And then what you're gonna see is you're gonna say, well, actually that payment for the second half of 2022, 2021 actually covers maybe a year and a half more 
of back payments because sometimes people are really slow to pay. So you might be getting paid for something that was actually performed in you know, the first quarter of 2020. So it's, it's a little bit wonky sometimes when you're trying to analyze the data. And of course, if we're presenting this, we try and filter a lot of that out, not filter it out, but present it in a way that this is when it was performed, not necessarily when it was paid. Um, sometimes it's better to show it that way so that you can really see the trend line uh, and see where it's going. And then other times it, it just doesn't matter. It's kind of all lumped in and, and you really don't have to look at necessarily when it was performed because it, it, when, you, when we look at both, we go, well, it's not really showing us anything that we're not seeing on when paid, if that makes sense. Um, but yes, we have gobs and gobs of detailed data that we use to build these particular uh, charts. And so one of the first things that we wanna do is we wanna look at the data by song. So as you can see here, going all the way back to 2018, you know, I can see how all of these songs have performed. And it's, and it's interesting, right? Um, so Love in This Club is like a great one. So that was released in 2008. And we would go, wow, 2008, what, that's 12, 14 years ago. Um, that song is an evergreen song. So that song should be in flatline. And if you look at uh, kind of 2018 as it's going along, it is in flatline. It's like 1100, 15, 12, 14. You know, there's a dip in 2019 to 900, but then it bounces back up to 13. And then all of a sudden, it's really starting to grow again. Now, I would dare say that it's probably growing because the overall pie is growing, but it could also be growing a little bit because, um, you know, Usher and Chris Brown were releasing new, some, some new songs that we can actually see pop up here. So, for example, uh, in 2020 of Q2, you can see the song went from 1,000 to 6,700. Now, that's because of, I believe, some performance um, uh, special performances that, that happened during that particular quarter. Um, but you can see it also coincides with the release of another song. Um, so you can, you can see that uh, older songs can see bounces when artists release newer songs. Um, but in this particular case, we can see that, wow, not only did we get a bounce at Love in This Club, but you know, it started trending up from the 1,000 to 1,600 uh, to where the last four quarters, you know, it went all the way up to 27, 27, 24. Um, so those are all the things that you want to look at. I want to see the trend of the more evergreen legacy songs. Uh, and then I want to see how the bigger songs are trending too. So for example, Heat. Heat had its heyday, you know, it took about a year for it to start to get to its heyday in 2020, uh, 2020 Q4 at 23,000. And then you see it start to trail off. Then it goes down to 15 to 11 to eight. And now it's kind of flattened out a little bit, like from 85 to 81. And we would look at that and go, okay, that song's um, getting on to, you know, two years as it gets on to three years. Oh, and then, sorry. And then it goes from 81 all the way down to 56. Um, so we would see, say that, you know, that song is going to start to flatten out probably in 2023. So it probably has a whole nother year of maybe going to 56, maybe going to 46, you know, and then, then ending somewhere around probably 2,700. Because you can look at some of the older songs and go, well, if this song, if Heat is very similar to Love in This Club, meaning how many, you know, how popular it was, how many streams it has on YouTube, things like that then you might be able to say, well, it's probably gonna go down to that $2,700, $2,400 line at some point. Um, if it's a bigger song than that, then you might say, okay, flat line for that might not be 27 to you know, 25, maybe it's gonna be 3,500 because it's a little bit bigger. So these are all the things that you wanna look at. And then just as a catalog as a whole, you're, you wanna look at, okay, well, how is this holistic catalog doing? And then how do I rank that? And that's in this, this bottom chart. I can see when the songs are released. Uh, I can see what their yearly income is. And more importantly, what percentage of revenue it is. So you want to mitigate risk, right? So I don't want, it's not necessarily bad that say 60% or 80% of my revenue 
is in one or two songs. That's not necessarily a bad thing if those are, you know, mega hit songs, but it is certainly nicer if you can have that spread across not only other top songs that are say in the top five or top 10, um, but more importantly, like if we look at the rest here at the bottom, like we might have catalogs, we do have catalogs where, you know, the top five songs or top 10 songs are 40 or 50% of the catalog. And then the rest is like 50% of the catalog, which is great as well, because then you're like, okay, the rest might be 50 songs or 75 songs. And that's just, you know, consistently generating, you know, that revenue over time. So you can see here, like the rest uh, on the, on the detailed chart has ranged anywhere from $300, you know, ending at about 300 and some dollars, you know, towards the end. So it, it ebbs and flows as some songs move in and out. So Paige, any questions you want me to address real quick? We're almost, almost at the end. We have one more slide. Um, it, we have a question on if there's like an average quote shelf life of a catalog and, you know, has that number stayed steady or are you seeing that decrease or, or anything on the shelf life of, of the music royalty catalog? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, so most of the songs that you're going to look at to purchase on any platform are going to be songs that have been hits on some level, right? Whether it's, whether it's a hit, like a pop hit or a rap hit, because if they weren't, they wouldn't be generating enough revenue for you to look at it, just to be brutally honest. Um, now we can have some masters that you might see where there's enough income from artists that you may not necessarily know, like they're not, they're not on radio, but they're big enough to tour. They're big enough to have a fan base and if you're looking at their masters, because that's that's where the most of the revenue is being generated in some is sometimes there you can say, wow, that's that artist is generating one hundred thousand dollars a year with those masters. But I've never heard of them. And, and there are those cases in, in when you're looking at masters and it may be a smaller artist and you may not know what they're going to do moving forward. You know, there could be more of a shelf life there where those songs might drop off to a level that you would go, okay, you know, that, that you know, that music is not music that uh, may last, you know, over time. Um, and if they're not touring anymore, then maybe it can fall even further than it is. But if you're, but that's again, very specific to, I'm buying the masters for a specific artist. When you're looking at most of what's gonna be for sale here, which is the songwriter share uh, and, and things where, you know, it was a top 50 song, whether it's in pop rap, Christian or, um, um, or rock, you know, those are, you know, you're not going to see kind of them kind of drop down to zero where all of a sudden, you know, there is a shelf life. Um, these are going to get down into what we call flatline and they're just going to stay in that flatline. Again, they can continue to have some slow degradation over time, but I would never look at anything that is in, in this kind of genre of music that we would say is, OK, it's done. No, it's it's always, you know, if it if it was a hit, you know, in the 80s, it's still streaming. Um, and uh, and so that that, again, is the, the beauty of of music royalties. Very rarely does a song just all of a sudden not stream anymore. But again, those songs just wouldn't be songs that we're making enough now for us to to look at them to sell, if that makes sense. Um, so the last thing that, that I'm gonna talk about and then we can open it up for more questions again is like, how do you price? So one of the things that you're gonna hear about a lot is a multiple uh, and multiple simply means, I mean, it's as simple as you can get. You'd like to think it's some fancy financial term. It is literally looking at the last 12 months of revenue and assigning a multiplier to it, a multiple, and then saying that's what the value is. So if the, you know, in this example, if it was making $10,000 in the last uh, 12 months, then, and it's a 10 multiple, we're going to sell it for $100,000. The only time it gets a little wonky is again, when you're not talking about an evergreen catalog and say something is, is still in that free fall, um, then you're still going to look at the multiple, but the multiple will change dramatically. So we wouldn't say, 
it's a 10 multiple, that might be a five multiple or four multiple. Uh, if it's an evergreen, it may be an eight, you know, to a 12 multiple. You know, Merck at Hypnosis and Primary Wave, you know, the catalogs they're buying are at like 15, 12, you know, 12 to 15 to 20 multiple. We've even heard of catalogs selling for 20 plus multiple. Now, for me, in, in, in analyzing music royalties, my whole, you know, not my whole life, but since 2007, a song is a song. You know, a Bruce Springsteen song, Sonny just bought Bruce Springsteen's catalog for, they estimated like $500 million. And I'm sure that was, that was a 20 multiple plus. Um, now, what's the difference between one of those Bruce Springsteen songs and say an Usher song that like that we just looked at, which was one of Usher's top songs? You know, why are they paying 20 for that? And, and we might sell ours for, um, you know, an eight or a 10. Uh, the main reason is, is that they want to spend, it's not that they're overpaying, or at least they, they don't think they're overpaying. Uh, it's that they only want to deal with catalogs that are a certain size because they're, they're dealing with numbers with a B in it. So they have to, you know, they, they don't want to spend time looking at my puny, you know, Usher song that is going to sell for $600,000 because it's just not worth their time to look at that. There's enough big fish for them to go fish, but it's great for you because they're paying 15 or 20 for a song that if we look at the trend line and the payback is exactly the same as these Usher songs. They're not any better. Those songs are no better from a risk reward or how that trend curve is going to pull out than the catalogs they're paying 10 and 24. So the bonus for you in this, I always go back to like, if you remember, I think it was Lending Tree or Lending Club. You know, initially in Lending Club, when it first started, uh, you know, you could go in as an individual investor and you could buy up credit card debt at like a 25% IRR return. Well, as Lending Club, Club got bigger and bigger and more institutional money came in, then that compressed the yield down to, you know, I, I don't know what the yield is now. In fact, I don't even know that they're letting the general public buy anymore. But that's the opportunity that you have right now. There, is a not, there isn't enough people in this marketplace to start to affect that yield, except it's inverted for you. You're not paying 15. You can come in and buy music royalties at a 6x or an 8x or a 9x. And you'll be able to do that until we get more and more people on the, on the marketplace. So this is a, a, a massive buying opportunity for savvy investors to be able to buy the same type of in the same class of asset that a hypnosis is paying 12 to 24 and you can pay, you know, six to 10 for. OK, so that's the way that we look at where our marketplace is today. Now, again, the value, the true value of that, we think is somewhere in between. Like me personally, I don't think these catalogs are probably worth 20x. Um, but somebody certainly is, you know, who, who have a lot more money than I do and a lot more knowledge are paying that kind of multiple. Um, but at anywhere on the multiples that we're selling at and even more going up to 10, um, you know, th those are all things that, that we think is, is great value to the seller and the buyer. Um, so those are the things that you need to look at uh, on, on uh, our platform when you're trying to figure out what is the price uh, that, that we should pay. And of course, you can go in. We don't always have the, the ultimate sale prices, but we do have a lot of um, auction data that you can go in and look at. And we're always happy to, to help in, um, uh, you know, we can't tell you what you should buy it at, but we can help you understand different things that you're looking at in the marketplace. Um, and uh, we've always had, I just had this last bullet because people have, have add, asked this question before uh, and trying to anticipate it. Uh, on the song vest, song share model, uh, we uplift uh, the numbers. So if we buy it, you know, for $100,000 from the seller, then uh, where we make money is, is we charge 16% uh, on top of that. 
and that's what our fee is. So, so something that's a hundred thousand would sell for one sixteen, um, and that's what we would then uh, carve up. You know, divide by two hundred fifty dollars to find out how many shares that uh, that are available. Um, so I know that's a lot to take in over a very small period of time. This is really just as a as a primer. Uh, if you have more questions, uh, we can always set up a call and go through some of this stuff more in detail. Um, and and uh, definitely for specific deals, if you wanted to look at those, and and we're going to start to add more and more on the marketplace as we transition over into song shares. Uh, we're more than happy to answer as many questions as you might have uh, on, on deals as they come available on the platform. Thank you, Sean, for that. Um, and for all of our listeners or participants today, please feel free to put any last minute questions in our chat or Q&A um, on the Zoom call. We do have uh, one question right now that asks if the investor participates in the depreciation of the catalog. Um, so, so yes and no. I mean, it depends on what you mean by depreciation. I mean, it's not an asset that you would like amateur, amateurize, uh, amateurize, I'm saying that right. For some reason, it sounds so. <laughs> um, uh, too much coffee today. Uh, so uh, again, as I was trying to explain before, it's, it's the, the asset um, will probably decline in value over time just by the nature of the royalties. Um, but as we saw, like with the, the song that we were looking at, the uh, Usher song, you know, that, that particular revenue stream actually grew over time. Um, so you could have a catalog that stays flat, say over a 10 year horizon. Um, it could, you know, only decline a little bit over that 10 year horizon. Um, but, you know, let's say that, that over that 10 years, the authors haven't all passed away yet. So there's still another 70 year horizon out there. Uh, and, you know, you could potentially sell that catalog for, you know, close, and, and who knows if the marketplace gets hotter and hotter, it could be that you could sell that catalog, you buy it in an eight multiple and you sell it for nine. And so even if the, even if there is that that degradation over time, if you're selling it for a higher multiple, it could be that you know, you're making the same money uh, and you've just uh, basically collected those royalties over, the, over that 10 year span. So I'm, I'm not sure if that answers the amortization question, um, but you know, there, there isn't, uh, you know, that's how we would look at it. That's great. Um, one question of just, You've talked a lot about what's happening, you know, currently in the industry, and of course, Songvest has our new the new song shares model. Um, but what what do you see? You know, what is your outlook on royalties? You know, in the short term. Oh, so everything is is looking up. You know, I mean, streaming, as we saw in those first charts, um, music royalties are continuing. You know, on a stampede. Um, so. Uh, so just if I look at royalties in general, the pie is getting bigger and continues to get bigger. I don't see any, any headwinds really on that pie getting smaller. Um, you know, and I'm not going to pontificate too much, but you know, Spotify is barely making money. And at some point, either they, they're going to have to turn a profit or they're going to have to start charging more. And any time that they charge more because it's percentage of revenue, you know, that can be more money for the overall pot. Um, so, so the short-term outlook and even the long-term outlook for music royalties in general and the consumption um, of, of how, on how they're being consumed are all looking up. So for example, you know, there was just a rate change to the positive for songwriters and publishers. Um, so people are continuing to fight to, to get paid more in this particular space. You know, I don't know how it happened that arbitrarily somebody, you know, at Spotify, I guess, decided you should be able to, you know, listen to all the music you want to uh, for $20 a month. You know, I mean, it would be like, 
you know, someone started a car rental place and said, you know what, you should be able to rent a car anytime you want for $20 a month or like movie pass, right? Where they arbitrarily set it. Well, that doesn't mean that the business model is there. Um, so, or a profitable business model. Um, so, so I would say, you know, all indications in the music industry are that you know, people are going to continue to fight to get paid more, not less. Uh, and the music providers are going to be under pressure to charge more and not less uh, because they already started at this, you know, uh, unattainable price that says you can have all the music you want for basically $20. Yes, that's great. Um, I think those are all the questions right now, um, unless anyone still here wants to put another question, uh, please email page at songvest.com if you would like a copy of the deck um, that we went through today. We do have three auctions, four auctions, I believe, up on the site right now for our traditional catalog purchases and then a few options of the song shares as well. So please check out songvest.com for those. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.